Good morning and welcome to the first session of the sixth day of Brain Awareness Week 2020, conducted by Gujarat Forensic Science University and organized by Dina Foundation at Ibrahim. I am Ann Paul for saying Master of Movie Psychology from Gujarat Forensic Science University and the moderator for today's session titled Human Brain Memory Vast Ocean of Remembrance and Forgetting. To share this session, I have with us Dr. Arun Pratap Sikharwar. Hey. Welcome you, sir. Hello. He is a faculty member and teacher, uh, and he has he conducts research on neurobiology, TUG, PG, and doctoral scholars. He has earned two of the postdoctoral degrees from Cornell University. And he also has a lot of research experience. He has delivered two TEDx speech over some interesting topics over brain memory, and also this appeared as a science expert panelist at various national TV channels. We are so grateful to have you, sir, and uh, in a very short duration, you accepted our invitation. Thank you so much. And so let's move on to the session without further ado. Sir, I request you to take over. Um, hello, good, after good, good morning. I'm Arun from Agra right now. So the topic of my presentation is human brain memory, the vast ocean of remembrance and forgetting. I'm taking this analogy with the vastness of the ocean, or I can say a deep ocean or vast ocean or wider than the sky. So the human brain memory lying in the human brain is also too much vast. At the same time, just like water gets evaporated from the from the water cycle of the ocean, so the same way, a lot of memory gets uh, getting off from the brain in the form of getting it, or we can say amnesia. So now coming to the next slide. So this is the vastness of the ocean. Now you can just have a imaginative idea, like how vast is the ocean. So. So the same way, I will let you understand the vastness of the human memory lying in our brain. In, in the due course of you know, our lifetime, that may be several decades or so, we keep learning and keep updating, just like a mobile phone gets updated with the newer and newer version of uh, software. So the memory keep coming up brain day by day, moment by moment, and gets accumulated. And then our behavior, works on the accumulation of that memory. So now I have this, uh, uh, my favorite uh, Dr. Abdul Kalam, uh, former president, he says, dream, 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 dream transforms into thoughts and thoughts results into action. These dreams are related to the game brain. I will let you know how these are related with the brain memory. And then Emily Dickinson's one statement that brain is wider than the sky. So in my previous slide, I was taking the analogy of vastness of the ocean, but even other people have taken the brain as a wider than the sky. So ultimately the meaning is it is unlimited. Now you already being a brain biologist or cognitive biologist, you know, a healthy brain harnesses a cognitive mind. A cognitive mind means a sound mind that 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 behave very nicely and in a sumptuous way. So, so for a cognitive and healthy mind, there's necessity of a healthy brain. Until unless you don't have a healthy brain, you cannot you cannot have a cognitive mind. And then having a cognitive mind, and then having a you know better and better than the rest of the world. Then you come across to make your own identity in the form of personalities and someone becomes like ceo i can say someone becomes king someone becomes something uh, rest uh, one step ahead than the rest so it is the utility of the brain and mind that makes demarcation in the in the in the world now they there was one uh, tedx ted video of i susanna herculin hosi she is a competitive neuroanatomist in US, she's a Brazilian author. She's the first uh, lady scientist who, who told us that there are 86 billion neurons rather 
in the books, we, we always see 100 billion neurons in the brain. And she keep working the, the uh, completive uh, architecture of the site architecture of the brain of different uh, organisms. And, and as you all know that uh, neuron is the structural and functional unit of the brain. And 86 billion neurons make a jungle kind of structure in the brain. They keep interacting each other, they keep firing each other, and there's a, a brain interactome that makes a, a brain. And over that brain, which is like hardware, a sound mind that is like a software develops in the brain. Now, now this is this slide which shows that brain to body mass ratio. So humans have like 70 kg uh, weight on an average, then the R then the brain size is like 1.5 kg. So this way, up to 2% is the brain to body mass. Similarly, for an elephant, which is like up to four to 6,000 kilograms, the brain is like 5 kg. Similarly, the whale, which is the largest organism in the world, which is having size of 50,000 kilograms as a brain of like 9 kg. So this way we find that the human brain is is the largest in comparison to the total body mass. So we are more cognitive also. So, so this is directly an indication that larger the brain, so large cognitive power. Now neuron, expenditure of neurons is quite costly affair. So they, as per this calculation, you find that in, in a day when we are using almost 2000 kilocalories per day, at least 500 kilocalorie goes only in the brain affairs. It means brain because there are a lot of, you know, electrical conduction going on one neuron to another. So they keep firing and they keep consuming a lot of energy. So the brain is greedy organ also also this way because it, it's having 2% of the mass, but it needs 25% of the total energy or kilocalorie. Now, uh, so this is the same slide. So 2% body mass of the brain lead up to 25% of body energy. And it does not compromise because neurons are in the G0 phase. Once they are tied somehow, they will not regenerate in, generally. So they, are, they are keep firing, they are keep running to make a brain active uh, throughout 24 hours. Now, there are almost 14 organ systems in, in, in the human body, in the medical, uh, medical students used to have several departments. Among them, this nervous system is the big boss. I can say like it's a master organ and the brain nervous, nervous system controls uh, other, other functions like endocrine system, reproductive system. So it is having hold of all the organ system uh, in the human body. Now, this is uh, an actual human brain. This is the front of the brain, which is somewhere here, I can say. And this is the back of the brain. And here you can see it quite clearly the cerebellum. In Latin, cerebellum means little brain. And this is on the back side here somewhere. And cerebellum is a very necessary for the body movement, coordination, posture, and, and this all. While this cerebrum is the largest part. Now, this is the actual brain you can see. And this is a freshly dissected human brain. This is the spinal cord. You can see the meninges here, have two meninges. Now, CSF has come out from this human brain. And you can see quite clearly the gyri and sulci. So this is our actual pain of that 1.5 kg. And a lot of cerebral arteries that, that keep giving uh, nurturing of the brain tissue with the fresh blood. Now, this slide shows how, how soft is the brain tissue. It's, it's like a paneer in India, or we can say tofu. Uh, and it's very much spongy, very much adorable, palpable, 
um, because this chip file is not working here, otherwise you would have feel this is very much soft. And it is so much soft that if you put human pain uh, on a table, then with that own weight, it fall down. So it is not having that hard structure at all. However, nature has made this cranium very hard, contrary to the brain's softness. Probably this is due to, to compensate that software needs more uh, uh, pampering. That's why this cranium or neural cranium is, uh, is very hard with the bony structure. Now, human brain is uh, divided in the cerebrum, cerebellum, and other parts. Cerebrum is the largest part. And cerebrum is having four lobes, frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and temporal lobe. Now, frontal as the name frontal, so it is somewhere in the front part. Parietal is in between somewhere, occipital on the back side, just up to the cerebellum. And temporal lobe uh, near our ear system. And center sulcus divides the parietal lobe from the frontal lobe. So this is a quite boundary. It's like a how, how these lobes are getting divided uh, or having some demarcation. And similarly, atrial sulcus divides this frontal and parietal both with the temporal uh, lobe. Now, these are the basic functions of various parts of the brain. And you can see that this uh, prefrontal uh, part for the motor function, frontal part is for the movement moment, problem solving, mathematical calculation, concentration, behavior, this all. In the frontal part, there's one important part, Broca's area, that is related to the speech control. So whatever I'm using, it is through the Broca's area's control. Temporal lobe is having mostly hearing capability, similarly brainstem for the consciousness and breathing and heart rate. That is related to the autonomic nervous system or that, that keep working without our conscious control. Similarly, parietal lobe is for sensations of touch, touch receptors, temperature, uh, tactile. These all functions are taken care by the parietal lobe. Occipital lobe is the smallest, which is related to the vision and perception. So whatever our eyes are seeing here, it, it is just a probably more physics part here. But the, the, the biological or neuro loss the neurobiological function is interpreted in the occipital lobe. In the temporal lobe, there's another important area, just like Broca's area, that is called Bernicke's area, that is for the language comprehension. And like how we understand more than one language, how we uh, respond, how we give reply, and cerebellum is to the posture imbalance. Now, there's an important system in the brain, it's, it's called limbic system. The name system means it is having more than one structural part involved in it. And this is also called as a paleomammalian brain, and which is also called as an emotional part of the brain. Okay, so in that, there's several other parts, as I told you, like up to 10 or 12, but more important is the hippocampus. Hippocampus is complex neural structure like a seahorse which consists of the gray matter located on the floor of each uh, lateral ventricles. Ventricles are the whole space of the brain. And it is intimately involved with the motivations and emotions. Similarly, for the memory, I will come ahead to this topic. Hippocampus is related to the consolidation and indexing of the human memory. Like whatever we learn, learning and memory, then it goes to the long-term memory through this hippocampus. Now, the brain, just like a computer is having a circuit, IC circuit, so the brain is having a lot of brain circuitry. I mean, the central nerve system is interwoven with, as I told you, billions of neurons, and there are several types of neurons also, if a bipolar, multipolar, like that. They also are interrelated, and they fine-tune each other, each function. It's like if I'm giving my this motor function, given, giving probably this thumbs up, then it is associated with several part of the brain and their cohorted, you know, interaction showing very precise motion uh, in the form of motor function of my extremities, like my hand or finger. So, as I told you, the nervous system is so important. Few of the important aspects I have just now narrated to you. 
and several we will come across further. So uh, as I told you, the mind, mind is like a software. Mind we develop with the interaction with the world by the by the by the teaching and learning by going through from one class to another or going for higher study, our mind keeps developing. Now this mind is having several higher faculties in that perception, reason, memory, will, imagination, intuition, I can say love, anger, hate, several faculties of the mind. Uh, among them, memory is very important. And as per my title of this presentation, I'll come to this memory. However, these are the parts are the part of neurocognition and neuropsychology that we study uh, everything. So now we have a conscious mind, subconscious mind. Conscious mind, I mean to say when I'm having something with my own will or with my conscious recall or with my conscious attempt. Subconscious mind remain behind to that, which is not in my control, but still it is active. Okay. And then both things lead to our body functions or our, our actions in the world. Now, so what is memory? Memory is one of the faculties of our mind by which any information which comes uh, to our body through any of the five senses, it could be listening, seeing, or touch, anything, that information undergoes encoding, storing, retaining, and then retrieval upon the knee. So like whatever I can comprehend in this presentation, it is based on probably a lot of memories that I have uh, already read, I have made the PPT, a lot of memories I've accumulated. On that basis, I'm, I'm doing retrieval of the uh, requisite information time to time, and then I'm giving my presentation. And memory is vital to experiences, and the retention of information of its time is useful for the purpose of influencing our future actions. So if we can't remember past events, then we can't learn or develop new language, new relationship, personal identity, and much more. What I mean to say that if I can't hold some part of memory of previous days or previous month or previous year, then certainly I cannot behave uh, in a proper and sound way today. Okay, so memory is being understood as an informational processing system and it's made up of explicit and implicit uh, uh, part explicit which can be expressed by the word by the writing also implicit is something which is unable to be written or told or transferred from one person to another that is implicit uh, functioning uh, okay so memories are the representations of our past experiences now as i told you it's a cycle of encoding of memory that is the first step of memory memory formation. So we have our five senses, eyes, nose, <clears throat> uh, tongue, ear, and skin, or some parts of the uh, effect for the touch. So, so this all information comes to our senses. And then they are, these information are encoded in the form of a neural uh, transmission, or nerve conduction. Then it goes to the central nerve system. Then stories and retention are important stories and retention means 100 percent in the form of 100 percent remains same for longer and longer period now you just miss in titanic movie how how rose used to remember after 78 years that all those steps of titanic accident and then she narrated. so amazing it is having a lot of duration but still one can have a perfect retention, so perfect retrieval of the <clears throat> memory. Retrieval is also called a recall and recollection. <clears throat> now, the memory is a constructive process through which we actively organize and shape information and incidences. I will tell you, forgetfulness is not constructive. That is another part of my lecture that I'll come to. Computer memory <clears throat> can be erased or overwritten. Now, this memory word is very common. Many people used to discuss in the form of a computer, my computer is having this much memory or whatever. So computer memory can be erased or overwritten, but, but human memory, brain memory is not so. 
Human memory is based on interconnections or synapses between the neurons. Now, I would like to let you know that human brain is having like 86 billion neurons. There was previous uh, imagination or, or, or hypothesis that one neuron leads and encompasses one memory, but it is not so. Then certainly we would have not more than 86 billion uh, bits or bytes of information. So now it is already proven that human brain memory remain in the synapses. As synapses are trillions, more than 100 billion, several times, so human brain memory remains in the synapses between the neurons. Brain is a parallel machine and computer is a serially fitted machine. This is very important. You might have seen when a computer is having RAM problem or little part defect, then computer will shut down. It means most of the part in the computer are fitted in a serial mode, while human brain is parallel machine. I mean to say, you might have seen few people having some bullet injuries or some TBI, traumatic brain injury or brain accidents where a part of brain is lost, even though people survive. It means it is not that if some part is defective in the brain, then certainly the death will. Okay, so memories are not stored and retrieved the way as in the computer chip also. So if the brain is like a hardware, then certainly brain is like a software. Brain and mind are not the same. Brain is part of the visible, tangible world of body. So you can see the brain with, the, with your eyes. However, the mind is invisible. Transcendent world of thoughts, feeling, attitude, belief, and imagination. I will let you know that in the neuroimaging techniques, we can take a photograph, we can take a picture, we can, we can see into the brain by, uh, by neuroimaging techniques of fMRI or EEG or, or FM, uh, there are several other techniques, EMG also. I mean, through that directly or indirectly, but mind cannot be seen. Mind only can be felt by, by some um, essays or some experiment. The brain is the physical organ and mind is not a physical organ. The brain is the center processing unit of the body, it plays a key role in translating the content of the mind, thoughts, feelings, attitude, belief, memories, and imagination. When Okay, these two words are very important. When we talk about feeling this way or that way, or thinking about that, or answering someone, or questioning something, or remembering something, or dreaming of another, that time we talk about the mind. We hardly ever, ever we talk about brain. And like you do not say that my eyes have some photons coming from the screen of this laptop and then it is going to uh, occipital lobe and another circuitry, which is uh, previous knowledge. It is correlating that this is laptop or this is there. So we hardly talk about brain talk. We don't talk about the neurophysiology. We don't talk about the brain function. But we all we only talk about the mind talk. So the mind is generally regarded as synonymous with the thoughts, thoughts, feelings, memories, and beliefs, and as the source of behavior. Our brain has a thought of experiencing an emotion. It is because our brain has done something inside. Our mind has tremendous power all the body function. And this is true in the case of meditation, you remember. In the meditation, people used to say that our, our whole body control can be uh, controlled by the mind. A computer uh, requires hardware to do its function, and the hardware needs software to make it true. A software hardware would be useless, and without hardware, software can be used. So the brain is like the hardware, mind is like the software. But in reality, the difference between brain and mind are more complicated uh, than the software and hardware terminology. At All India Radio, I gave a uh, radio talk sometime before human brain and computers. So I was having all the differences and similarities between the human brain and computer, how they are similar and dissimilar. 
But remember, this computer has come up in last 78 years, especially this recent generation after two, 2000, only in last 10, 20 years. Now, this computer gen genesis is based on the human brain only, remember, directly, indirectly. And now a lot of, lot of, you know, neurobiology aspects or information is being inculcated to make a newer and higher cognitive or, or, or we can say more powerful computers in today's world. So indeed, our memories lie somewhere in the 100 trillion synapses of the brain, as I told you. Number of neurons in the human brain are 86 billion neurons, and they are fitted together in the brain interactum here, in the brain. Now, if I say about memory, then I should take the reference of Atkinson and Seferin Morgan. It was the first model of human brain memory given in 1968 by these two scientists from America. So they, they say that there's a sensory input all the time to our body, like our senses are getting some information from all around the environment. It makes the sensory memory. If you don't pay any attention, you just, then immediately it gets washed off. But if you pay an attention to any sensory memory, then it becomes shorter memory. And if the shorter memory is having uh, better encoding or it is having rehearsal, then it transfer into the long-term memory. Long-term memory remain for unlimited period, I can say, until unless some neurodegeneration or, or, or some TBI happens in the brain. And otherwise, long-term memory remain throughout our life. Okay, so now basically this the memory is here divided into three part iconic memory. That is the visual sensory memory and uh, which register pertaining to the visual domain, like, like with the eye, whatever we are seeing here. Equate memory is with the ear, is one of the sensory memory register that is specific to retaining auditory information. Like someone uh, cries out my name and then immediately I come up, okay, someone is calling me. That is equate or I just remember someone's voice or intonation, or I just can recognize, like a mother can recognize a uh, son's voice very nicely. Similarly, there's another haptic memory. Haptic memory is more important for the brain language in today's world. When, when the people, even you might have seen this brain language in the elevators or lifts, where uh, the people who are visually impaired can, can see and feel the numbers. Now, there's a Miller's magic number, uh, number seven, Miller's magic number seven plus minus two. This scientist gave this, uh, this idea of Miller's magic number seven plus minus two, saying that a shorter memory is having only five to nine items. That is why right? seven plus minus two. But, and this is only, uh, only, only, only viable for like 30 seconds, I can say. However, many people have the prime up and practice and, you know, the uh, habituation for increasing it for more window period. But generally, but generally we, we have a, up to 30 seconds this uh, information. That's why you know uh, whenever someone gives you the mobile number, you chunk it with the 989, 239 like that, and we chunk it so that the, the number of pieces does not exceed like seven, eight, or nine. And this way, the shorter memory can be rehearsed and can be having more chances to go into the long-term memory. So the memory is having now three types, sensory, short-term, and long-term memory. Now, long-term memory is divided into two parts, declarative or explicit memory, and processing memory, that is the implicit memory. And this explicit memory is going to into the episodic memory and semantic memory. Semantic memory is like a factual, like, like, like I can say Taj Mahal lies in Agra. Episodic, when you remember ear-wise or your uh, ear-wise progression of some information. Here, implicit memory is the processal memory, 
blood process in memory like cyclophidin. Okay, so now long term memory, this is the process memory, like how we write the cycle, how we do the car driving. Declarative memory, semantic memory, that is general knowledge. Episodic memory, that are personal recollections of the memory for uh, long duration. So long term memory is like these shapes where the information lies for longer and longer period or even unlimited period. Implicit memory is also called processual memory and non-declarative memory. Implicit memory cannot be read. It cannot be given in the notes by writing. It cannot be transferred from one person to another. Like, like if you know the car driving, you cannot transfer just like a key of the car to the person that you can drive like that. So implicit memory, every individual has to develop on its own. Similarly, even walking is uh, the first implicit memory in the childhood, okay? And then for forever, for whole life, we have this habit. Even this buttoning of the shirt is one of the implicit memory, okay? Now, sleep and long-term memory, they are very much correlated to each other. So it is being found that the people who, who are deprived in the sleep, they are unable to make long-term memory. It means the night sleep is very much necessary for the indexing and consolidation of new memory. So what people, neuroscience, uh, cognitive biologists say that in the daytime, when, it, when we are learning a lot of many things, we are coming across new and newer information, when we go to the sleep in the night, that time, that time we are sleeping, motor function of the body is as minimum as possible. But, but hippocampus very much uh, active that time. It takes all that uh, day long information. Mm -hmm. It does indexing and consolidation and send this information in uh, to make a long term memory. And that's why sleep deprived person especially the drivers you can you can have heard of they they lost the attention and, and this way it gives directly the indication that sleep is very much necessary for uh, memory now there used to be when my another all into radio talk on dreams and the study of dreams is called neurology so neurology means like it is the scientific study of dreams, how they develop, what are the meanings, how we have a very varied kind of dreams, and what happens in the brain can be even take a photograph of our dreams like that. This all comes in the neurology, and this lies in the YouTube. So how the information of human memory is known to us today? See. Uh, as I told you, human memory is part of uh, mind. So we can't take a photograph, we can't take a CT maze or MRI, or we cannot do anything. It means human memory, which is, uh, which cannot be seen, which only can be perceived. So uh, there, there had been some stories behind how this information of human memory is, have come up. Now, the, you all of you would have heard this patient HM. Uh, in, in neurobiology or medical biology, generally we don't disclose the name of the patient. We give some short name. But once the patient or subject dies or from the world, that time people used to uh, disclose the name. So patient HM was Henry Gustav Mollison. Um, in his, uh, like he was in 20s, and then he fell down from a cycle and then he started having epilepsy. And in 1954 around, um, he was having very severe episodes of scissors. So he was taken to a doctor and doctor decided that he will be doing lobotomy of some part of the brain. Lobotomy means uh, to remove out a part of the brain. So the, the, the neurosurgeon took away some part of the brain like this. This is the Henry Gustav's brain slice after his death. So he took away two third part of the limbic system. And he also took away the uh, hippocampus from there. This way, this person was having anterograde amnesia. 
Integrated amnesia means after this operation or lobotomy, newer memory formation was not there. However, he was having old memories as such. So he couldn't, he could use bulky memory, like he was able to eat uh, food and he could drink water, he could put the butter and he could use the tie and process the memory also could, but he was having severe problem to form new new memory, semantic memory, semantic knowledge. So, so he was the first person by which doctors finalized, okay, okay, probably this is that part of the brain which was necessary to make new memory. And that's why we have, rather than a whole brain now, we concentrated, okay, this is that little part of the brain which is more important for the human memory. And during the course of his lifetime, he was interviewed and taken as a subject by neurocognitive biologists maybe more than hundreds of studies, patient HM in the world. Now, one more important person who gave all this data of human memory very much is Clive Euring. In 1985, um, this Clive Euring was associated, he was, a, he was a musician associated with the BBC radio in London. He, he got the herpes uh, viral encephalitis. Okay, and uh, then this disease led to affect very much, uh, you know, negative effect on the central nervous system. And then all of a sudden, he bent into the comatose state. And then later on, once he awake, he was having both anterograde and retrograde amnesia. It means he was unable to make new memory formation and also his pool of old memory lost away so he was the first person uh, studied very well studied it is not so that uh, no he was the very first person in the world but reported person he was having both the aspect interrogative amnesia and retrograde amnesia and he was not able to make new memory formation and it was so happened that next morning whenever he was getting awake in the home he used to say that I'm still alive. He used to ask his wife that, have you not taken me to a doctor? And he used to feel that as if he was in a coma. And he always forget everything after just 30 seconds. So like some guest is coming and he used to ask his wife, and who has come? And he was told, suppose that person X has come. And again, he used to repeat uh, another minute or so, that who has come to a home? Like, so this was my first TEDx lecture I gave about human brain, memory, and neurobics. So brain, as I told you, memory, already I told you, is one of the faculty of mind. Neurobics is similar like aerobics. Like aerobics we used to do for the body, for increasing body mass, for muscles. And similarly, the neurobics is for the brain exercises. I mean, to keep brain more healthy, to keep brain more active, so that I will come in the next few slides about the neurobics. So this is the brain, these are the neurons, and then, then billions of neurons make a synthetic network, just like as if you are in a helicopter and seeing a evergreen forest, how their branches are in, uh, interrelated. So this is the way how neurons are you know, uh, make, a, uh, make a connections in the brain. This is the brain bow of uh, mouse brain where these neurons are firing and you can see quite wide network or kind of a jungle of neurons and, and they are interrelated to each other. And this is a very new recent technique of neuronism where we can have a even colorful uh, neuron uh, to differentiate between the inhibitory and excited neurons and so on and so forth. So memories connect our past with the present and future with the present. So if memories are not there, then how, how, how difficult would be our life? Amazing. So learning and memory is an integral part of our practical life. Ultimate behavior, communication, education, worldly knowledge, are the culmination stored millions and millions of bits of information that lies in a memory bag of our brain. Uh, recently, there was a 
debate that uh, human brain has how much capacity. Because as I told you in my previous, one of the picture, it's like an ocean. I said, like a vast ocean, or that was my title of my presentation also. So it is certain that human brain has unlimited capacity or unlimited virtually means extremely, extremely high. So Professor Paul Raver, he was professor of the neurocognitive sciences at Northwestern University. He gave one tentative uh, idea that probably human brain is having 2.5 petabytes and that is equivalent to like two like uh, uh, sorry 2.5 million gb and you imagine these hard drives are just few gb probably this hard drive is 8 gb for me so we have 2.5 million gb uh this much capacity of the brain that equalizes like 4.7 billion books so it's like a huge uh, space okay so these are the aerobics these are the neurobics for the brain how we can keep our brain active if brain is active so mind is active and memory is one of the faculty of the mind so healthy brain means healthy memory also so now as you all know there are five senses of our body vision hearing smell taste and touch all five are uh, in a conscious state Getting a lot of information from the environment, it goes to the brain. And now coming to the neurobics. Neurobics is brain exercises that you have not to do in a in a gym or some other place. You can do it any any time. Now already you might be knowing that right-handedness of the person is having more left uh, left, left brain hemisphere active. Similarly, for left-hand person his or her right hemisphere is more active. So this is the contralate effect. Now, it means probably our brain is not totally active, equally active in all the parts. Rather, these are some differences. Now, if you are a right-handed person, then certainly you make a habit of left-handedness. Like in the daytime, I should use at least five minutes to use my left hand. Similarly, if if this baby is in the bathroom, rather seeing with the eye any shampoo bottle, would it be possible that he assume and see the size, texture, uh, shape of the bottle and then try to find out that which bottle is that? So these are some, some special habits which you have to do in the daytime and these are called neurobics. Okay, so this way after closing the eyes, taking a shampoo of his own choice is one of the neurobics. Similarly, you close your eyes and try to latch the door, try to find, uh, 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 like put the steps, like where the door could be, where could be the ledge, where could be the cupboard, like try to have active brain. Similarly, you can say you mute the, the TV and uh, suppose this is the cartoon, and you try your own uh, cognitive mind to make out what are their means, like to read their fronts, their feelings, their emotions, and then try to make a sense. This is also one of the neurobic exercises, okay? Similarly, if you're going to place A to place B or from your office to home, then certainly you should change the route. Like one day if you're going this way, then another day you can take other route rather than doing the same way in the same route. Because when you explore the several other routes, it means you're making newer and newer brain interactome active for making newer and newer memory formation. When you have more memory, then you have more chances of alternative ideas and feelings. And then you are more cognitive. Similarly, somebody who is not having an experience of chef being in the kitchen, one should try to do this job also. So presently, like we are in the lockdown of this novel coronavirus, many people are trying to learn the kitchen job, okay? So in kitchen, it's very important. This is also one of the neurobic exercises for a newer person who is not primed to the kitchen, like like to see the consistency of the, uh, the curry by feeling the smell to get to know that whether the curry is ready or not by seeing the 
and by smelling the condiments and spices, like your all senses are active. Okay, this is one of the. Similarly, this baby, uh, uh, he's numismatist. He's having a lot of coins from the other countries, and then with the shape, texture, with the with the words written on the coins, he's trying to find out which one is dinar or dollar or a pound or Indian rupee, and this way. Uh, the person can can learn uh, or can utilize the brain actively okay there's several um, ways to learn newer and newer habits like playing game uh, playing even chess going mountaineering going different different games chess these all are related to the neurobic exercises so one should not be having a monotonous life or having one kind of job rather one should use several different kinds of habits. However, this does not apply in today's lockdown period when we are closed inside our home, okay? So one should use not the routine way of life, being in the comfort zone, rather one should keep doing newer and newer things, learning newer and newer uh, ideas or jobs or, or different assignments this way our brain is more active. If brain is more active, then certainly it's gathering more and more information of memory. If someone is having more memory, it means he's able to manipulate and used to explain the world in a better way. So there are brain exercises for good memory. One should use uh, test or recall. Okay, This you can use in Sudoku game. You can enjoy music also. Music is also good. Mathematics challenge in the mind, enjoy cooking habit, learn foreign language. So be like bi or trilingualism. This is also one of the good example of neurobic exercises. Word picture, draw a map of memory, like mind mapping. Now there are several apps on the Android phone also I've seen. In, in that way you can you can be uh, have a chances of improving the memory, learn a new sports, etc. And for a student's perspective, more we process and information, the better it is to remember. So memory is very important for our examinations to remember. Because during that three hour inter period, you have to remember a lot. Then you have to do retrieval of the information and writing down. Larger we are exposed to any information, the better we remember it. More we hear, higher the probability of it's being remembered. Rephrase and explain yourself. Be emotionally involved with the situation. Schedule the chunks, okay? And use mnemonics, just like Bivcure is one of the example. As the brain is neuroplastic in nature, already you know, plastic means something which, which you reshape it, but once again, come to a different shape. So our brain is also neuroplastic. It keep adapting and to change continuously throughout an individual's life. So it is not static in nature. So one should try to keep using the brain throughout the life. So neuroplasticity is also called as a brain plasticity. It leads to both structural neuroplasticity, like corpus callosum thickening is there, or some part of the brain gets more active. And it also leads to the functional aspect on the basis of neurophysiology. Okay, so the purpose of neuroplasticity is to optimize the neural network circuitry for betterment. Now, there are some examples of TBI, traumatic brain injury, where the part of brain is demise to a subject suppose then the person develops newer habits suppose emptied hand of an army soldier after some time with the with the with the non-dominating hand also he's able to do the good things so these are the few examples of neuroplasticity um you might have heard of jiva that is doni's daughter she is right now having six languages knowledge okay so in a childhood, child brain is more active, okay? It, it is more adaptable. It can learn and pick up newer and newer information very quickly. So I would say the brain is wider than the sky or vast than this ocean. And nothing is impossible, rather the word says that I'm possible. So one should keep using. Now coming to the different part. Now, can you imagine this word? Uh, so this is the forgetfulness, okay? So this is just opposite to the memory. When memory amount is decreasing somehow, that time it leads to the forgetfulness. Now, amnesia is a 
a neurobiological term, amnesia, is unusual, but forgetfulness is usual. You might have come across, we all of us have some degree of forgetfulness. Like you are going inside a room and then all of a sudden you forget for what purpose you have come here. So memory loss, amnesia is unusual forgetfulness. Yes, so it's like amnesia is a kind of like a medical problem. Probably something bad is happening and doctor may come up into the picture. But forgetfulness is, okay, forgetting things occasionally is a part of life. And that's why people keep reminder on their smartphone, sticky notes and their refrigerator, study table, etc. Okay. Now, normal aging and Alzheimer's disease. Now, Alzheimer's disease's hallmark is the forgetfulness. So making a bad decision once in a while is normal aging characteristic. Similarly, if every day, all the time you are having bad judgment, it means something is wrong. It means you have a neurodegenerative power or some disease. Missing a monthly payment is okay, but every month you are doing, then something is wrong. Probably it leads to the Alzheimer's. And similarly, these are the difference between normal. So the amnesia is made uh, divided into the four part, anterior grade amnesia, retrograde amnesia, transient global amnesia, TC, and infantile amnesia. So after the incident of some, some, some hitting or some accident, if newer memory formation is not there, that time it is called anterior grade amnesia, or if after an accident or perturbation in the brain or some accident, you forget the uh, old memory, but newer memory formation is uh, equally good, that time it is called retrograde amnesia. Now you remember this alcoholic creates to the integrated amnesia where for four to five hours, a person hardly remember anything. Even if somebody fall down in the on the road or something, the next morning says, I don't know. So it's a temporary integrated amnesia. Now TGA, that is transient global amnesia, it is severe forgetfulness. And sometimes you forget like where you have come, what do we want? For what purpose you are come inside the home? Or that's why I told you, you keep reminders in the, in the phone. That is TGA. So TGA is, again, not that much, you know, severe problem. There are no such true medications. But it just so happens. It's a sudden temporary episode of memory loss. Now, coming to this infantile amnesia, now... Uh, I, I don't think you all of, like me, would not be anything remembering back now the period of one to three years of your age. This is called childhood amnesia also. It is presumed for the importance of early life experiences on later physical, mental, and emotional functioning. So probably our mother nature has developed this habit that we, we hardly do remember that part of our early, early life and later on. But remember, in the world of 7.4 billion, not everyone has infantile amnesia. There are few individuals or there are few, I can say superhuman kind of individuals. They still have their very much uh, infantile memory and they still can remember it. And I have come across uh, uh, one, one review article. Uh, yeah, this was the review article in infantile amnesia, forgotten but not gone. It says that memory of that period still remain in the mind. Uh, suppose if something hit or something, you know, uh, provoke or initiate, then still you can remember. And probably it is the same analogy that how we come across some stories in the movies or so when a person does remember the previous life experiences. So, but generally we keep uh, the nature shut off this three, four year period and we don't remember. Now, there are nootropic drugs that are related to the brain memory. Nootropic, no means mind and tropic means turning in, in, in Greek. So, how nootropics are drugs or smart drugs or cognitive enhancer. These are the drugs, supplements and other substances that may improve cognitive function, particularly executive functions, memory, creativity and motivation. The use of nootropics by healthy individuals in the absence of medical prescription spends a controversial issue. So it leads to the, some ethical aspect, okay, like why one should use this much. And nootropics and smart drugs have become awake 
and confusing in recent years. So no topics are okay, but uh, smart drugs are related to uh, having some controversial aspect. And okay, they affect the judgment. So nootropics, the chemistry, we talk about nootropics, they are certainly central nervous system stimulants. And these are few compounds like amphetamine, methylphenidate, eugeroids, caffeine, nicotine. These are few chemical compounds. Certainly there could be more than this. And they lead to if effect on our central nervous system. They are neurostimulant, I can say. And they are very good for the ADHD subjects also, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And nicotine is also good. Nicotine might have seen a lot of people smoking cigarette and BD or tobacco. It is related to that. Nootropics herbs, these are part of our Ayurveda since long. And uh, Bacopa Manori, Penex, Ginseng, Ginkgo, Balova, the several drugs, you know. I'm sure you, you know, few of the drugs, you see Ashwagandha and Brahmi, these tablets even I use, okay? These are very much nootropics. I mean, they are brain stimulant and they generally lead memory uh, retention and retrieval better, okay? So nootropics, they increase the learning, okay? And memory retrieval and are good for the brain. Now, there was one article, scientific article, over the Red Bull. You might have come across, and you can read here. It was uh, being used with the placebo, uh, this Red Bull, and it was double blind, double blind study in a cohort of subject. And certainly, they, they were, they were a positive result that Red Bull gives better retention and retrieval and better cognition, and just like giving a better output, okay? Now, you remember this, another, you know, brown, black loin. I use this sometimes whenever I'm having my, my interview or some important things, okay? It is similar to that red book. Now, I, I have read several books about the memory and these are one of the few, okay? I have a lot of big list here. You can see Behavioral Neuroscience of Learning and Memory a lot of neuro uh, ebooks are there, and one can read and one can feel good with that box. So, you keep a healthy brain. Uh, just a few more slides are there. Recently, I gave my second TED talk. It was related to the human brain memory and computer and internet. Now, don't you think, you know, a lot of memory is over the cloud of internet? I mean, like, I'm having very much information in my mobile phone. And I'm dependent on my mobile phone to have my reminders, birthday reminders or so. A lot of information of Wikipedia or the piece is lying in a mobile phone. It means the human memory, which was solely property of the human brain, is now offloading over the internet. And this is happening in like last 20 years. So now, now it means the information or memories of one person is is divisible and usable by other person. Like if I write one article today with my mind, then it means my mind memory is now having dividend with the other individuals over the internet. So there's an accumulative fact, okay? This is called cognitive offloading of memory of the internet. This was my recent TED talk. Um, and in that I gave uh, a hypothesis and, and some topics already you might be knowing digital eminence or Google effect, how we are dependent on the Google every time. We just keep forgetting and we keep asking Google, what is the capital of uh, Cambodia? And then again, we remember, again, we ask them. But this Google information is more volatile. Like again and again, you ask, but once you do read and write by yourself, your brain, that time it is more permanent. Memory. So Google effect is this way. Similarly, in the future, how the brain memory will be offloaded on a, a brain to machine interface that you might have come across and might have listened to Michio Kaku over National Geographic and Discovery Channel. He talk about how the brain, even a, even a dying person brain can be taken the memory over the internet and then we can lead to the perpetuation of human being. Okay, it means the memory will be uh, uh, persisting forever, however, the, not the mortal body. 
So there are several stories of the brain we can discuss here. Now, use the brain very active. It's like a muscle. Use it or lose it. This would be my last slide. And thank you so much to listening my presentation.